My guest today is Fiona Scott Morton. Fiona is a professor of economics at Yale University. She holds a PhD from MIT and is a fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Her research focuses on the economics of competition and antitrust. She has previously worked as a deputy assistant attorney general for antitrust in the Obama administration. Hello, Fiona. Thanks for being here. It's great to have you in, in, in our program and to talk with you about competition and, 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 and markets. So uh, thanks for being here. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So, so you've written a couple of very, very, very recently written very influential papers on, on what's happening in the, in the uh, social media industry, which is a big concern for European regulators and for Europeans more broadly. You've talked about how Facebook is basically behaving in, a, in an uncompetitive um, way. I, I quoted Financial Times, a long Financial Times article about your papers, which, where you said, um, it's like having the old AT&T regulated monopoly back again, only it is not regulated. And I wanted to start by talking about the antitrust case against, uh, against Facebook. What's, the, what's wrong with Facebook? What, what's the basic uh, anti-competitive behavior they engage in, in your view? They have taken deliberate, as far as I can tell from the um, available evidence, um, deliberate steps over the years to eliminate potential competitors and nascent competitors. The way a social media network works is that you want to be on the network with your friends. So it's very, uh, it creates a very big, what we call barrier to entry or competitive advantage to have an existing network. And it takes quite a bit of a push to get people off that network and onto another one because they have to go together with their friends. Um, so that new entering network has to have something really fun about it or a compelling value proposition to get people to move. And what Facebook, what we see from the uh, past history of Facebook is that Facebook did things like use an app, Anavo, and other means to find uh, competitors that were starting to grow and either buy them or squash them. And sometimes they uh, bought them like Instagram and WhatsApp. And in other uh, occasions, perhaps those potential threats were uh, operating on the Facebook platform like a Vine or uh, some other sort of um, complement that makes a platform exciting and fun, but they eventually grow so big and so popular that it creates a risk that it might make a competing platform. And then Facebook was able to use its control over APIs and compatibility with the network to cut off those, those uh, functions, those apps, and uh, therefore make them shrink and become irrelevant. And in this way, avoided competing on the merits head to head with potential entrants who would have come along and created choice for competitors and choice for advertisers. So, so give us one example of these, what you called uh, in the paper, dark patterns, escaldoggery, and other misleading <laughs> and fraudulent practices. Give yes. us one example. The, uh, uh, what's a dark pattern? A dark pattern is when, let's say, you'd like to unenroll from something, some subscription that you have been uh, subscribing to. And you go to the site of the, of the provider and you look for the place that says unenroll. And you've managed, you, maybe you have to go to manage your account. And inside manage your account, there's maybe some payments or some uh, another choice you have to make. And then uh, to get to unenroll, you might have to go through three or four windows and it's not clearly labeled and you have to find the small downward arrow. And then eventually you hit unenroll and then another window comes up. Are you sure you want to unenroll? And you have to click again. So you might have to click many times to get out of this subscription. Whereas typically that provider will have said, would you like to enroll? And that will be in clear, large font on the very first page. You can probably enroll with one click, even if you have to disenroll for eight clicks. And we can show, research has shown that consumers give up so that you don't get as many people on enrolling in my example as would like to. Uh, it's just that they can't find it. And, and they say, oh, I'll do this tomorrow or next week. And then a year later, they're, they're still enrolled. So, so the law, I mean, and we're, none of us are, 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 are really in, in those aspects of these problems, but the law always talks about intent. Do we know that Facebook, for example, when they purchased these big uh, potential rivals at the time, maybe not so big like WhatsApp or Instagram that eventually became big parts of the platform, do they know they were worrying about potential competition? 
Uh, you can see that from the pattern of acquisitions, the fact that it goes on for so many years, both the acquisitions and also the API cutting off. And um, the also, I think we can infer some intent from the prices that Facebook paid for these. These were not prices that would probably reflect the ongoing value of the business if you didn't take into account lessened competition and the lower threat to profits. Now, um, if you're a government agency investigating these, uh, this conduct, then you can ask for internal documents at the company and there might be investment bankers who said, here's why you want to buy them because they represent a future threat. There might be a board meeting where the future threat to competition is discussed. There might be internal emails between top executives saying, this company does what we do. They're very similar to us and we expect them to grow. Uh, they're popular with teenagers or something. And we see this as a serious uh, threat to the corporation. Mm -hmm. So, so one thing that, that people would want to criticize uh, your view would, would say is, well, you know, consumers are getting a good deal. They're not paying. What's the harm being done? What are the harms here? What are the things that actually I would, many people would say, well, they spend hours having fun with Facebook or Instagram and it's for free. Right. Uh, so let's remember what economists always say. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, what you're doing when you interact on Facebook is you're giving them your data and your attention. And they are selling that to advertisers. And so you want to think of it as a barter transaction. Like if I give you six apples and you give me four oranges, I'm not paying any money, but it still might be that my six apples are worth six oranges and you're giving me four. So if I'm giving you a lot of data in the form of apples and you're giving me service in the form of oranges, maybe I should be getting more service. Maybe I should be getting actually a payment each month as well as the free service because my data is very valuable. We're not going to know that until there's competition for the consumer's attention. So how is the consumer harmed? Well, if there's more competition, she might get paid money. She might get better services, more services, more exciting uh, things happening on that platform. Um, the advertisers would receive lower prices in a world where there's competition for places to put ads. Let's say there's multiple social media networks, an advertiser has many choices and can go to one that has lower prices. Advertisers, when they pay for advertising per click, that, what that does is it creates a higher cost of acquiring a customer. It, you, customers click and then you get them to come through and buy something. Well, that's a higher marginal cost for that advertiser. Their product is going to reflect, the price of their product that the consumer pays is going to reflect the higher marginal cost that it costs them to acquire each of those customers. So consumers also pay for the higher advertising through the costs of goods and services. And then a last harm, which is a really important harm. Well, I shouldn't say last. There are two more harms. One is um, content providers and publishers. Those content providers and publishers are being harmed by Facebook giving them low remuneration, lower prices for their content because Facebook's a monopolist. If news sites get paid less for the news, they don't have as many reporters. They don't deliver as good quality news. If the site that gives recipes and cook, cooking tips doesn't have as much ad revenue, they don't have as many recipes. Their photographs aren't as good quality because they don't have a financial incentive to invest in the site because they're not getting paid. So content on the internet is a major way that consumers benefit from the internet, and this is harmed by Facebook. And then lastly, there's always the issue of privacy. You know, how much do consumers really want Facebook knowing all that they do and then selling it? Uh, to others. There, is, uh, there are some uh, people that worry, and you also mentioned some of these, about uh, potentially the, the manipulation of the political discourse, the fake news and all that. Uh, is that, is that something that, that you think would be lessened by competition as well? I do. Um, the ad-supported business model wants the consumer to stay online for a long time, because the more minutes she's online, the more ads she sees. How do these platforms achieve that? They achieve it by showing consumers very um, arousing and sensationalist things. That makes you stay longer than something truthful and useful, but a bit dull, like the meeting of the school board about what's gonna to happen to the school. 
So um, what happens is if you let a machine learning algorithm loose in these kinds of platforms, those machine learning algor algorithms discover that people click on arousing sensationalist content and therefore the platform delivers more of that uh, content. And that is really a quality degradation that I don't want myself exposed to and I don't want my children exposed to. If there were more platforms, uh, and there were more choice. And one of those platforms said, we're going to make an environment safe for children. We're not going to do this. Here's the kind of news we're going to offer. And it's going to be in this format, authorized from particular sources. That would be a place I would rather go. And I would rather my family went to. Um, we'll talk a little bit later uh, about what Europe can do about it. But, but, but focusing first on, on, on this particular platform, Facebook, what kind of remedies can we think of um they've been talking about oh they're going to improve their content i mean uh, zuckerberg is, is an expert of but at, at, at uh, kind of pretending that he hadn't realized how cleverly devious his model was and promising yes. to correct he every year promises to correct. Yes. what what should what should society do and for example one thing that that i was thinking when you were talking about whatsapp and so on if a merger in retrospect proves to be actually preserving your monopoly power, et cetera, and the authorities have made a mistake. Is it possible to reverse mergers? What kind of remedies can you, should we think of? Your paper talks okay. less about these, these issues. So. That's right. Uh, there are remedies that you can achieve through an antitrust case, such as unwinding those past mergers. Yes, that is perfectly possible and uh, might uh, be a helpful remedy because then Instagram would be an independent platform competing with Facebook as would WhatsApp. Um, my own view is that what we really need to do is think about social media as being the modern telephone network. Back in the day when the telephone was the way we interacted at a personal level, we had a network that was interconnected with everybody. You didn't have a separate phone system in one corner of your country and another one in another corner. They all connected to each other and anyone could phone anyone. If you think about the wireless handsets that we now enjoy, these work the same way. If you have Vodafone and I have Orange or somebody else has T-Mobile, all of, we can all talk to each other because those phones connect. So I think that the most useful remedy um, to add to the normal antitrust mix for Facebook would be mandatory interoperability. So that if I started up the, the network that I described, one that's very safe and only has certain kinds of news, that I could send friend requests to Facebook and for my aunt, and Facebook would pass that on to my aunt, and my aunt would say, yes, I'd like to be friends with Fiona, and then her posts would show up on my network just the way an AT&T phone can call my Verizon phone. And this would mean that Facebook then would, my aunt would say to herself, well, there's, uh, there's this really clean, nice network out there that I could go to and I could still say, keep all my friends, but I wouldn't be exposed to this fake news and all these bad uh, content that I don't like, so I'm gonna leave. And that, I think commercial pressure on Mark Zuckerberg is possibly a very effective way to have him decide, is he gonna be the platform for the neo-Nazis or is he gonna be the platform for the mothers? You know, he can, he can <laughs> so, which so, is more profitable. If you know, how, 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 I mean, you talk to all these people in this area, how, how far away is that, this kind of idea? How invisible or how feasible it is to actually impose this kind of public utility model? Um, so let me point out, it's not a public utility, well, so you can do it a few different ways. I think in Europe, you're actually quite close to it because you have calls for studying what kinds of regulations you want, and you could have this as a regulation and simply adopt it and be finished. In the United States, uh, if the FTC were to bring a case against Facebook and design a, a remedy, the remedy could include mandatory interoperability, that the government would set up a standard committee and make a format for exchanging text and photographs and video, and Facebook would have to interoperate with any uh, social network that complied with that standard and wanted to interoperate. And that might be the right way to restore the lost competition, 
that Facebook has over the last 10 years been, been squashing. Do you see there is a kind of a political window of opportunity for this kind of, 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 of decisive action? Do you see this as politically? Uh, well, certainly the FTC has an open investigation, as do the states. Um, so it's really, I think, about um, whether they can win. So that's a decision of a judge. And then if the government wins, there's the, we don't have fines in the United States. We're supposed to do remedies that restore the lost competition. It's quite hard to think of something that's gonna restore the lost competition given the network effects here and the fact that everybody wants to be on platforms with their friends. I think interoperability, like the phone system has proven, uh, works really well. So, um you, you uh, let me move on to your to your second very recent paper, which is Google. Um, there, the case is harder from the perspective of public opinion, I guess, because we all feel like okay, we like our Google Maps, we like our Gmail. I mean, we don't feel as kind of mm, attacked uh, in some sense by Facebook as uh, by, by Google as we we have felt many of us by Facebook. But you still say in the digital advertising market, virtually all roads lead through Google. Google could say, well, we are not doing any evil, we're just, you know, better. Um, what's the case against Google? What's the way in which they have abused their, their market power or done things that um, help them preserve or acquire more market power? Um, after Google invented their very good search engine, what they did was um, set, set forth on a, on a journey to impose exclusive contracts on nearly all sources of traffic. So first those exclusive contracts were with portals and um, wireless carriers like Verizon and then with the iPhone, with handset makers, so that Bing could not get on to those uh, sources of traffic except if the user took steps to load Bing um, because uh, Google was the default on the front screen. Uh, after that, uh, Google launched Android and became um, active. It, you know, Android is a mobile operating system and therefore required all handset makers and wireless carriers to put Google search again as the default on the front page of that handset. So those exclusives shut out Bing from quantity of searches. And if you don't have quantity of searches, you can't build quality of searches because you need to learn what consumers are looking for. So those are not, those exclusives in my view are not competition on the merits. It's not like Google saying, oh, I've got a search engine, Bing's got a search engine, consumers please try them both and use the one you think is better. No, we're gonna force everybody to use ours and then if you do that, of course, eventually yours will be better um, because of these quantity. Um, In fact, some of, the, some of the aspects that you discussed sound quite similar to the Microsoft first screen control default uh, on using the Microsoft search engine uh, explorer at the end of the 90s. It, it, the case is, is relatively similar in that sense, right? I agree with you. I agree with you. And, and why has it been hard to make? Um, well, uh, the FTC staff recommended uh, that the FTC bring a case against Google in 2013, and the Democratic commissioners uh, did not vote for that. Um, so that's Julie Brill, Edith Ramirez, and John Leibowitz, and I don't know uh, what the reasoning was there. Usually staff recommendations are, um, are quite powerful. Um, but then the story continues because let's say you want, therefore, to enter with a search engine, you now have to enter with a search engine and a mobile operating system together so that you can put the search engine on the handset because you need to have your own operating system to do that. Google further had a contract with its handset makers that prevented them from launching their own operating system based on the open source Android. If they launched that, uh, their own operating system, they would have to stop selling Google uh, Android handsets. So you'd have to go from 100% Google to 100% your own, and of course that's super risky. Um, that you know your own your own operating system might not work. Um, so that's another way to raise barriers to entry. And then Google took the uh, advantage in search 
and leverage that into display. And the paper that I uh, released a few weeks ago talks about how Google bought different properties in the display stack and then again used this exclusive tactic. You cannot buy ads on YouTube, which we own, unless you use the digital display ad technology that belongs to Google. And Google will set it up so that rivals are disadvantaged, they're slower, or their prices are higher, or they uh, are getting the bad, the dregs of the opportunities and not the good ones, um, and tilt the playing field to get more and more of the share to Google to the point where now public, on the publisher side, Google has about a 90% share. And in the uh, middle, the ad server, um, the, the demand side platforms and, and servers in the middle, 50 so Just explain that a little bit more to your listeners. So when you are going to the New York Times site or to some other site and you see an ad for uh, some, some display ad for a holiday or something, 90% of the time, what is it exactly that Google controls? Just, no, you're, you're saying in your paper, it's not just selling that ad to the platform, but much more, right? No, Google will, uh, for 90% of those cases, Google is operating the publisher's technology that decides which ad to go in the empty spot. 90% of the time, Google is operating the server the advertiser uses. Let's say it's Coca-Cola operating that ad server. Then the, in between those two ad servers is a confusing set of technologies that, for example, creates bids and goes out to different ad exchanges and says, who's got supply, who's got demand, what are the bids, how am I gonna figure out the winner uh, from these bids? Google runs a lot of those operations and chooses how to set the price. So Google's operating for the buyer, operating for the seller, designing the rules of the auction, and running the auction. Okay, so if you were buying and selling stocks like this, you would never agree to it. Like, I'm not going to sell a stock when I know that you're, my agent, the seller, is also working for the buyer and is also the auctioneer and is also deciding how the money's going to flow. I mean, obviously, you're going to get a large take rate in that, in that world. What's a take rate? The difference between, let's say, the advertiser pays one euro and the New York Times gets 30 cents, the 70 cents is the take rate. And uh, that's going to be high when you have a profit maximizing firm doing everything. I think that was super clear. I mean, this sounds like the perfect monopoly, right? You are the exclusive agent for the seller, for the buyer, and you are the one running all the price determination in between. So it is, it is pretty kind of scary. And then you didn't add one last bit, which is the maps. How important is the maps in this whole story? Google Maps. The maps, uh, we need to go back to search for that. Um, Google Maps is really important for search. If I am uh, searching for pizza, it's probably because I'm hungry and I want to buy a pizza right then. And it matters greatly where I am. And because we're all carrying mobile devices, the device or the app can know where you are. And that enables the selling of advertising by local businesses, nearby businesses, or rel just relevant businesses for my geography. Um, that's extremely important. I think it's one reason why Google purchased Waze, because Waze was a very uh, successful, accurate mapping system. That it, and if Waze had contracted with Google's rivals, let's imagine Bing, or let's imagine one of the specialized search engines, uh, then those that combination would have been able to deliver very uh, good localized information also, um, geographic information. It's another reason why some authorities are looking at the purchase of Fitbit, uh, because that would enable Google to learn more about where the person is. So then let's go, although it's kind of clear, clearer in this case, let's go again to the harms. Who's getting harmed by this? What is the, what is the problem if Google is, has 90% of the market, yeah. who was, who's suffering? Well, of course, search is really important. And if we had two or three or four companies all competing hard in search, we'd have more innovation in search, we'd have higher quality in search. So that's really important. Then the people who buy the ads, the advertisers, once again, this is customer acquisition. They pass those costs through to consumers, at least in part, and we're all paying higher prices for goods and services because our firms are paying higher ad prices. And then, particularly on the ad tech side, there's a real harm to content on the internet. 
if you think about an advertiser paying a dollar and the website getting 30 cents, let's imagine that in a competitive market, the advertiser would pay 90 cents and the website would get 70 cents, okay? In other words, the take rate of the, of the ad tech stack would shrink a lot under competition. Well, what is the practical effect of that website going from 30 cents to 70 cents? Well, their revenue just doubled from advertising. If they are a cooking site, they're going to give me more recipes with better pictures. If they're a news site, they're going to give me more reporters and more, more high quality. So the quality of all the of all the businesses that we like to consume on the internet is badly affected when ad revenue doesn't flow to them, when it's flowing to Google instead. And the ultimate way in which Google can maximize its ad revenue is if it doesn't even have to pay the 30 cents to the publisher. How does that work? Google News, Google Flights, Google Local. Right? In all of those cases, you, are, you the user are being directed to Google's properties and Google can keep 100% of the advertising uh, money there. But that then decreases the variety and, and breadth of the, of the content on the internet. And I think this, as a, as a user, this is something that increasingly, I think, bothers me and bothers many of us. Like, yeah. you try to look for something, Wikipedia is the fifth result of, of most people go to Wikipedia. Rotten Tomatoes has disappeared from the page and there is something else. Um, this seems on the face of it really anti-competitive. You're the monopolist, you're an essential, essentially essential facility to, to reach these destinations and Google is kind of directing you somewhere else. This, this does look on the face of it very aggressive. How are they getting away with it? Um, because antitrust enforcement is not working very well anymore. In the United States, we have courts that are quite hostile to enforcement, I think, in many cases. And we have not been moving the ball forward with respect to cutting edge technologies. We haven't been bringing cases that are about ad supported businesses. So now not only do you have courts with a high standard, you have courts that are unfamiliar with the technology and no precedent. In Europe, the cases have been brought, but they take a very long time. And then there are fines at the end of the day, which doesn't change the competitive landscape. So consumers don't see an improvement because the fines don't, don't alter their choices. So I agree with you, it's a tremendous problem. I agree with you that there's harm. I think the ability of the most important input provider of eyeballs to move those eyeballs to its own uh, services in order to degrade the quality of a rival search engine, for example, is harming competition in the short run and the long run um, and depriving consumers of the innovation and the choice that they would otherwise get. So uh, I, I think we need to improve the way we police competition in this space. Um, Fiona, this, this is something that, that is very interesting. Why did, why did this evolution in US courts and, and other places happen. And there are several hypotheses. One of them has been bandied around very much lately is that ideas matter and intellectuals and particular economists here have been spreading a certain, uh, a certain set of ideas that basically have neutralized antitrust enforcement by saying that, well, most, most of the times nothing really bad is happening and if it's happening we cannot really do much about it etc um do you think it has to do with ideas i mean the chicago tradition which is one that we, we know well uh do you think it has to do with interests it's also true that many of the experts and many of the economists who write about these things are often uh, a bit conflicted uh, on, on on their participation what what's been going on in Japan? I think all of those things have been going on, Luis. Um, I agree with you that you had the Chicago School in the 70s, but uh, in a new paper that I've written with Herb Hovenkamp, one of the things that's very interesting about that time is that the economics, using economics and antitrust was not actually the goal. The goal was less enforcement. And the economics in the 70s delivered the, le the answer of less enforcement quite often. But after you had the game theory revolution and more uh, 
empirical techniques and so on. If you take economics, it's a tool and you can use it to assess a situation and it will deliver you sometimes the answer that you should enforce and sometimes the answer that you shouldn't. And the Chicago School has not embraced modern economics for this reason, I believe, because it does not always give them the answer that they want. Modern economics quite often gives the answer that enforcement would help social welfare. And as a result, you get the Chicago School being parroted by people who don't want enforcement, but think of our colleagues, how many true Chicago School adherents are today publishing in top economics journals, doing research that is actually cutting edge. Uh, that, you know, the cutting edge research being done by the 30 and 40 year olds is not of this style. It's a uh, much more open, uh, much more uh, able to find um, what the true competitive uh, environment is. And, 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 and what about the other type of explanation that, I mean, you were also hinting at the start, which is that, that many of the people, you know, there's a lot of money to be gained by saying that nothing happened. Yeah. If instead of saying that Facebook was terrible, you said Facebook was great, you could be an expert for Facebook yeah. and, and make some big so, facts, probably. Yes, there are many experts, and I uh, include myself in that group, um, who get paid by different firms and, and, and therefore have to be careful in public. I will say that, you know, the upside to having some of these consulting relationships is that you learn a little bit more about how the companies work, and I think that can be healthy. I think the main place that I see the money being very damaging is that big companies that are um, skirting on the edge of the antitrust law, like let's take Qualcomm. Qualcomm will actually spend money, money funding a journal that has, that has an impressive sounding title, but is actually paid for by them with an editor who writes the papers, does the refereeing, publishes the stuff. Qualcomm will fund conferences. Qualcomm will invite their own lawyers to come to the conference and be on the panel with the MIT professor and beat up on the, on the economist and then publish a conference volume or a blurb in a practitioner magazine. And then I saw once in a, in a brief uh, uh, the statement that patent hold out was a much bigger problem than hold up, and I won't bore you with the details of that, with a footnote. And the footnote had three sources. And I thought, oh my goodness, three whole papers that show this thing that I think is wrong. One of them was a paper that compares computer chips to pinball machines and says, wow, they have different profiles of prices. Therefore, I've proved that hold out is a big problem. So that's just an incorrect paper. The second was the uh, conference uh, some kind of document that came out of the conference where this paper was presented. And the third was a collection of papers presented at the conference. So it was three sites that were designed to look like there was a lot of intellectual weight behind this statement. And in fact, there was no intellectual weight behind the statement. And so if you have a lot of profit on the line, you will pay for these kinds of reports and conferences and fake journals and things like that. And I think it creates a huge problem because then those get exported to the law and lawyers don't know that that's not a real journal because they don't work in economics. And why would they? That's very reasonable. So this technique uh, of the monopolist works. That's, that is pretty sad. I guess it happens in pharma. It happens whenever there is, there is big yep. tax, I'm afraid. Um, so then let's go to Europe. Um, uh, Europe has been portraying itself and trying to to act, uh, for example, in the in this area as a as a regulatory innovator, as an intellectual leader in regulation. For example, with the GDPR uh, directive, do you think that Europe can aspire to set global standards in a world where the U.S. is kind of abandoning this? And do you think this is something where um, this ambition makes sense, or do you think we should just uh, mind our own business? I think this ambition makes tons of sense. I think the United States, for a variety of reasons, has lost uh, whatever leadership position it had in the antitrust area and has a lot of its own house to clean uh, before regulation of these platforms is going to be the number one problem in the country. So I think it creates an opening for Europe to devise some sensible regulations. Uh, privacy regulation is a very good idea. I'm not sure that GDPR is 
perfect. It's not my area of work, but I hear people complain about it. But in the United States, we have nothing. So obviously, one would like a privacy regulation that was effective. I think that some of the problems in enforcing the antitrust laws around these platforms could be dealt with through regulation, either saying, look, we're not going to try to do it through antitrust. It doesn't work very well, and here's why, or or just say there are certain principles we've thought about and we think we can apply them to uh, digital platforms and that will get us better, more competitive markets at the end of the day. And I think uh, trying to move forward on that in that direction is would be great. Uh, for one thing, it'll probably help consumers, but for another, we can all watch and see uh, how these markets develop and see how firms respond and what happens to consumer welfare and maybe other countries will imitate or improve on uh, the regulations that Europe adopts. It's often been uh, criticized antitrust enforcement in Europe as very focused on fines, etc., and not on structural solutions like breaking out a company like the US did with, with AT&T, for example. Would you agree with this? Should we be looking into a different type of antitrust enforcement for Europe? I definitely think that the fines are not working. Uh, the fines, uh, they're too small to have a deterrent effect. I mean, if you told me I would make $100 billion in profit over a certain number of years, and in exchange, I would have to pay a $7 billion fine, I would say, sign me up, right? Sounds great. Uh, so that's not going to deter anybody. Um, but I don't, at the end of the day, think that the fine is the right way to do it because you're not restoring the competition going forward. For consumers, if if a party has broken the antitrust laws, we want to fix it uh, somehow. And fixing it is is not achieved with a fine. Fixing it is achieved with divestiture, or interoperability, or data portability, or royalty free licensing, or sharing of. You know, somebody could say to Google, "You have to share your maps or your uh, map of all the Wi-Fi beacon locations across all of Europe." has to be available for royalty-free license to somebody. I mean, that's just a random uh, choice of a piece of data that could be shared that isn't very personal, for example. But these are the kinds of creative things that a regulator could think about. So uh, after having talked uh, about anti-competitive uh, behavior in these new industries, there is, uh, you've recently written a paper called a proposal to limit the um, anti-competitive power of institutional mm -hmm. investors. But you worry about the fact that uh, we get increasingly very large participations from the same large investors in multiple companies in the same segment, meaning that somehow the companies don't really have much of an incentive to compete with each other. Uh, what's your diagnosis of what's going on? What's the solution that you propose in this in this paper? Well. What's going on is troubling. Um, it, I'll illustrate it with a US example, but in Europe, the sovereign wealth funds and individual investors are also often common owners. But for example, we have four now, only four domestic, big domestic airlines in the United States. And the biggest mutual funds, Vanguard, State Street, BlackRock, and I think Wellington might be the fourth. Anyway, the big three and Warren Buffett own 5%, let's say, approximately, of each of them. So 20 to 25% of each of those big four airlines is held by the same four top investors. Now, if those airlines softened competition against each other, competed a little less hard, they would earn more profits. And those owners would benefit from those higher profits. So if the owner engages in corporate governance and goes in and talks to the management or participates on the board or votes or has analysts following the company who provide strategic advice or whatever, uh, those people are going to have an incentive to try to get those firms to compete less hard. And they have both an incentive and, a, and an ability to do that because of their corporate governance function in the way that I, with 100 shares of American, you know, no one's going to listen to me. But they're going to listen to the head of Fidelity or BlackRock. So 
you have this very worrying situation that you alluded to, which is we might not be getting as strong a competition in these types of industries as we otherwise would because they share these owners and the owners have the same goal, less competition. Um, what we propose in the paper um, is a policy uh, by the antitrust authorities. I mean, one route might be a, an enterprising class action lawyer assembles a bunch of airline passengers and says, let's sue, uh, you know, American because they're not, uh, or let's sue Vanguard because they're investing in American and causing uh, my, our airfares to be too high. Okay, that would be very messy because then it'd be, let's suppose they won, a judge would say, okay, Vanguard, you have to divest from American. Well, that would be now what happens with soda and what happens with banking and what happens with brewery, uh, you know, beer. And is it just Vanguard or is it also Fidelity? But if Vanguard's divested from American, don't we want Fidelity to own American? It would just get very complicated very quickly. So our thought was, look, let's say that in oligopolies where there's a lot of competition, if you're a large owner, you can only own one company. You may invest in one company in that oligopoly and not multiple companies. If you're little, we don't care what you do, but if you're big, you have to pick one. So now you can invest a lot in American, but then you aren't holding Southwest and Delta and so on. And that means that you care greatly about Americans' performance, and you're not going to be incentivizing American to hold back and not compete against Southwest. You want American to have profit and take share from Southwest where, where they can and so forth. And so that's the idea of that proposal. But I, I do think that this area needs a lot more study because it is, if it's a problem, we don't fully know it's a problem, but if it's a problem, it's a very big problem. Because it's happened basically through the entire economy that ownership is getting concentrated. Mm -hmm. Very few hands, which are the Correct. same. Correct, correct. The big funds in the United States have grown a lot and now institutional investors hold 70, more than 70% of the stock market. So that's a big, for any CEO, that's a big share of, of owners. Okay, just one last question, which is, is, this is also in competition, but it's a little bit further from, 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 your, from your recent research, which is about state aid. What we see in Europe is because of COVID, um, there's been a, huge relaxation in state aid rules to allow governments to help companies which are in trouble. Of course, the risk with that is once you allow state aid to proliferate, you lose a level playing field in Europe. And part of the intellectual discussion seems to be moving towards um, the idea that, okay, Europe needs to have more supply chains need to be in Europe and uh, strategic purchases need to be within Europe. So you start to see develop an industrial policy, which is very different from the one in the past, less focus on competition, more focus on champions. How yep. do you see this kind of development? What's your view on it? I think uh, national champions is very dangerous. Uh, it's very difficult to choose a national champion that's actually going to win. Um, and when you think about the welfare of consumers, you want to think about what is going to make them happy. Now, low prices and high quality make them happy. Clean air also makes them happy. So it's perfectly fine, for example, to have, in my view, to have requirements about environmental conditions that must be met if a product is going to be sold in Europe. But those environmental conditions could be met by a maker, possibly outside of Europe, um, as well as one inside of Europe. I think the issue of supply chains when there's a pandemic is more narrow and is of less concern to me. Like we had this huge crisis over the nose swabs, which are made in two places in the world, you know, Italy and China. And it seems like governments need to be able to stockpile. But if you are worried that the stockpile doesn't work properly because the products degrade or something like that, I think it is perfectly reasonable to say to hospitals, you must have 50% of your swabs or ventilators or something made in a supply chain inside our jurisdiction. And this would create more robustness in the global system. I think many countries would do that. And then when we have a pandemic, everyone there's many more supply chains to turn to 
and we aren't quite so fragile as a globe in terms of getting ourselves healthcare supplies. But I would if not. It swaps, why not chips? And if chips, why not? Uh, I mean, computer chips, obviously. And if not computer chips, why why not oranges? And why not? You know, what's strategic? Yes. How do you stop? Yes, so I think that that was exactly what I was about to say. Where do you stop? Um, and of course, then we go back to how are we harming consumers? And I think when you're talking about something like oranges, uh, we could eat apples for a few months, uh, and that would be a diminution of consumer utility, but not the same way dying from a, a deadly disease is a problem. Um, so I, I just, I think like all things, where to draw the line is not crystal clear, but there may be some products that belong on the side of the line that says anywhere in Europe, by the way, doesn't have to be my country, we want to have a supply chain for a few critical health needs. Um, that also, by the way, is not the same thing as a national champion. Uh, no, so I don't know what the economies of scale are in nose swabs. It might be that you could have three or four places to make nose swabs across Europe, and it doesn't need to be associated with national champion. It's just about reducing risk in the supply chain. Well, thanks very much, Fiona. We learned a lot. It was really, really interesting, and uh, um, I really appreciate your time. I hope these uh, papers on Facebook and Google and this recent work goes, goes far and changes the way we're we're dealing with these industries. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Louise. It's a great pleasure to be on your show and it's great to see old friends in these uh, in this time of social distancing. So, <laughs> Same hope, here. I hope you hope stay well. See you in person soon. All right. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye.